So at this time, I'm pleased to welcome faculty member Wendy Quinton. Wendy is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychology and teaches undergraduate courses in instructional psychology, scientific inquiry, social psychology, and the history of psychology. She is also the director of the Psychology Honors Program and teaches the Honors Psychology Seminar. Welcome, Wendy. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk to you today about my experience in spring of 2020, which I think I can speak for all of us was an experience. It was, it was quite a transition. And I want to echo a lot of what Maria said that what we did was truly extraordinary that we were able to pull this off. Um, and it was ultimately uh, a really good learning experience for me. So I'm happy to share this with you. Um, I, I have to say I was thrilled to see what Maria did uh, to teach an acting class um, through Zoom and to do it so effectively and to come up with so many creative innovations. I was quite inspired by it. I got a lot of ideas by it. And I think that's why we're doing um, sessions like today so that we can all really add tools to our teaching toolkit. So Maria said she's not somebody who uses PowerPoint and I am. So I teach typically pretty large lectures and PowerPoint is my mainstay. And we were given our structure of PowerPoint. So I think I'm going to go ahead and shift to that and walk you through my process for spring of 2020. All right, so me. I thought I would start by saying what I was teaching in the spring of 2020. So I was teaching two sections of scientific inquiry, which is an introductory course in research methods. So these are large lectures. They were over 100 students each. Students, they don't take scientific inquiry because they yearn for it. Um, they take this course because they have to. If they want to be psych majors, they have to take it. And if they want to major in other uh, different programs, baccalaureate programs, this can be a course that counts for a requirement. So I basically ask every semester, how many of you are taking this for fun? And I get maybe one hand and it's often raised ironically uh, because nobody takes these courses for fun. Uh, so it's kind of a, a course people look at as getting through. I personally love teaching this class because I view it as a public service announcement for science, but students take some kind of getting there. Usually by the end of the semester, hopefully I can get many of them there, but most of them don't look at this as a fun course. I was also teaching history of psychology, which is an upper division, upper level course for psychology majors only. And it's taught to what is typically psychology's smallest class size, which is 42 students, other than the honor seminar, which I teach in the fall, which has fewer students in it. But this is 42. And that's a lecture-based course as well. But for all of my lectures, I'm exactly of the same mindset as Maria that my classes are conversations. So I view myself in a classroom as a conversation facilitator. I provide information, I ask questions, and I really am dependent on the interaction with students in order to be effective as a teacher. So when spring happened and we were told we were going online, if you remember, it was the Wednesday before spring break. And I remember we found out we were going online and a big part of me was relieved given COVID and the threat of the coronavirus and the threat to my students. Um, but a big part of me, to be honest, my main reaction was panic. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How is this going to work in an online environment? Um, I was pretty overwhelmed thinking, I don't know that I can wrap my brain around how I'm going to do this. And I will say that in the psychology department, we have several instructors that are very skilled at teaching online and very experienced teaching online. I was not one of them. And I actually endeavored never to teach an online class because I believe so wholeheartedly in being present with students and interacting with them that I thought maybe I can get through my career never teaching online. And that was my goal. Uh, and then I had the panic of, oh my gosh, how am I going to learn all of these things in a week to 10 days? So after I 
went home, calmed down, and admittedly ate my weight in dark chocolate, I decided, okay, then now I need to figure out what to do. So what to do was prepare. So I sought to prepare. And what did that involve? To really look at this online learning environment, ask myself, what are the tools here? How can I learn to use them to my advantage? And to look for a way to do what I really value in the classroom in this new learning environment. So I tried to view it as a challenge, um, kind of like trying to find hand sanitizer, which I was not successful in in the week of spring break. I was able to find toilet paper, but not hand sanitizer. So, but I viewed this as a challenge and that helped shape the choices that I made. So I'll walk you through those. So what did my online classes look like in comparison to my on-campus classes? So I wanna start with lectures. So I teach large lecture courses where there's a lot of information. So I needed to find a way to get the lecture material to students. And what I did for that was record them with Panopto. So you heard Panopto mentioned earlier this morning. Panopto allows you to record your lectures and edit them and then post them through UB Learns. Now I will tell you, I had used UB Learns before to do very rudimentary things. So I posted the syllabus there. I would post course announcements there. I used that to post grades for students, but I didn't use any of the other tools on UB Learns. And I'd only used Panopto once before when there was a blizzard, I think it was either two or three years ago, there was a blizzard right at the beginning of the semester and I really needed to stay on track. And so I recorded a lecture with Panopto. Then I remember it took me the better part of a day to do it because I had no experience doing it. And then I promptly forgot how to do all of that. So when spring of 20 came along, I had to relearn Panopto. So I recorded them with Panopto I posted them on UB Learns and I chose to post them at the scheduled class time. So I typically teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if students had a 10 a.m. class, they could expect that lecture to post at 10 a.m. just like the regular class. And I did that because I wanted students to retain some sense of schedule and normalcy so that they would have what is as close to what we had in person as possible. So I posted them there. I incorporated interactive components into the lectures and I had to get creative with how to do this. And what this involved is typically when I'm lecturing in person, I pose a lot of questions to the class and I wait for them to respond. So I still did that in the online recorded lectures, but I did it a little differently. Obviously I couldn't wait for them to respond or I'd still be waiting, uh, but I would pose questions to students and because I had taught the courses during the semester, I taught them before, and I could pretty well anticipate the thought process students typically have when I pose these questions. So I would play through the options. If I posed a really straightforward question, I would say something like, so you may be thinking this, and then play through that. If I posed a more challenging question, then I would go through possible decision points. You may be thinking X, or you may be thinking Y, you know, and then play through those to get to the correct answer, which might have been Z. So I still did that. I then did lecture practice activities, which involved having students encouraging them to work through a problem. So I would pose a problem. Uh, you know, often this is in my research methods class, I'll pose a, a design to them. All right, in this design, what effects are there? And what can you determine? And so I would do that and I would instruct students, encourage them, pause the video here, work through this, and don't hit play again until you've got an answer and then we'll go through this. So we did a lot Wendy, of that. Wendy, yes. let me just yes. interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we're not seeing your screen. Are, did you think you were sharing your screen with us? Yes. Uh, okay, we're not seeing it for some okay. reason. Try sharing let it. Me tr okay, let me try here. Hold on I'm one sorry second. To get you off track. No, please, thank you for interrupting me. Let me go out of here. Let me work for a second here. Okay, so, okay, you can see me, right? Correct. Okay, let me share. Okay, so, let 
me do desktop one. Hold on one second here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so you can see my screen. Let me go ahead and do this. Okay, sorry about that. So nope. by the Thank way, you. this was my panic slide. So we missed the panic slide. That was my preparation slide. So hence the hand sanitizer. Sorry, these jokes just didn't land because I didn't share correctly. Sorry about that. Um, so what do my classes look like? All right, so here I am. Um, so you guys can all see this, right? Okay, perfect. So I did these posing questions, lecture practice activities. I also did quizzes. So these quizzes didn't count for credit. The quizzes were similar to what I do in class, which is pose a quiz to, to students and say, all right, let's try it. Let's see, test your knowledge. And I did that in the PowerPoint slides that I had. And so working through that, I told students, okay, let's see how many you get correct. And those interactive components were very similar to what I did in class. These lectures that I had were available through the end of the course for streaming, but not for download. And what that did is help me control the content. So I controlled the lectures, I owned the lectures. They could stream them whenever they wanted, but they didn't own them. So that's what I did for lectures. For assignments, I posted and graded assignments in UB Learns. I had never done this before, so this was all new to me. And some of the grading was collaborative with teaching assistants. So for the two larger lectures, the scientific inquiry lectures that I had, that was collaborative with the TAs. I could do collaborative grading. So I did that. And then there were exams. So these are large classes where I have multiple exams. I'd never given an exam on UB Learns before. So I was gonna walk you through the process of how I did this. First, I administered the exams via UB Learns. And as I said, I'd never done that before. UB Learns provides you with many, many options uh, to choose from in doing exams, which I learned about in, in spring of 2020. And I did practice exam procedures. It was done as an extra credit, uh, as an exercise prior to the first exam. So what the reason I did this was I wanted to make sure that students had connectivity and they knew how to access the exams and that they could check their connection. And of course, that wouldn't be foolproof for what students were doing on the day, but it would give them a chance to practice what you needed to do to take the exam online. I did this as an extra credit. And what I'll say about that that I think worked well was I had in it four questions that were you know, just easy little quiz questions that didn't count for anything other than you completed this. But as part of that, I had an image because in my exams, I often have an image of a, a graph, a, a figure, something like that, that students have to decipher what does this data array show. So I incorporated a picture in this practice exam extra credit exercise. And I did that so that students could see if they could actually see the picture. And I would know if they saw the picture. So for this practice exam procedures extra credit, the picture was, of, it's an arty shot of a French, French bulldog in gym clothes, which is funny. So I would ask them then, what do you see here? And if they didn't, didn't know what it was, then I knew they couldn't see the image. And UB Learns can be sometimes a little bit tricky about showing images. So I wanted to make sure they could see it. So I did that. The exams were made open book. So this was a big decision point for me. It's something I have never done before. Typically when I give, give exams, they're given in person in the lecture and it's a paper and pencil exam. It's controlled environments. I have proctors and large lectures. Everything is under my control. Into this online environment, I realized I did not have a lot of control over the student's environment, what they're doing. And I read a good deal during spring break about how to structure a class like this. And there are good arguments, I would say, on many sides of how to structure an exam. I decided, okay, I'm gonna make them open book. And the reason I found that to be the best option and why I did that was, at the time we heard about the Respondus lockdown browser, but we heard that it could be beaten and students would report about how they could beat this. I also heard that sometimes that browser may be particularly problematic for students who have trouble accessing 
the latest technology. And so it could be differentially negative to some students. I worried about that. And what I was ultimately settling on was the idea that I wanted to get students to jump on the academic integrity boat with me rather than me policing everything that they're doing to make sure they're not cheating. I do that in an in-person class because I can control all these variables, but in this environment, I couldn't. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna try this. I will be honest, this made me nervous because normally this is not how I give tests. But my goal was to try to even the playing field for, for everybody and potentially de-incentivize cheating. If people know, okay, it's open book, you can always go and check that definition. If you don't know, I thought it might de-incentivize some cheating. So I did that. Given that, that I made that choice, I changed the definitional questions that I had to application questions. So in history of psychology, I often have questions that ask people to recall historical events or particular innovations from a theorist. And I changed some of those questions to more application questions, meaning I, I usually have application questions on exams, but I really increased the number of those. So I had the questions more about, given that so-and-so did this, explain how that might work in this environment. So you have to know what it is and now apply it, which makes students think more than a definitional question. Uh, so I changed many of the definitional questions to the, these applications. Students could see the entire exam at once. It was not presented one question at a time. So the reason I chose that, you have an option in UB Learns, as I said, you have many, but you have an option to restrict it so students can only see one question at a time. And that potentially can reduce cheating, especially if students are taking exams in the same space at the same time. But students report really disliking this. And I talked to a number of really good students, students who are typically straight A students, and I asked them what their experience of taking tests was like, and they universally said this made them very anxious and they felt that they couldn't get a good gauge on exactly the whole exam and what it is when they're taking it. And so it really increased their anxiety. So I said, all right, I made it so they could see the entire exam like they could in a paper and pencil. And I did have forced completion, which means students could not start and stop the exam. So just like an in-person exam, if you started the exam, you had to complete it. So that's the forced completion. And I made it available for a seven hour window. So 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. that included the class time. So all of my classes were between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, so that seven hour window gave them, okay, that could be the time that you normally were in class and would take an exam, but now you have some flexibility. And that was the reason I chose this window. We were encouraged to be as flexible as possible. So I had that open window. I was available via Zoom during the class time and I checked my email continuously during the exam period to troubleshoot any problems students had. One thing to keep in mind is I was teaching classes that were the two scientific inquiry were well over 100 students, one at 117, the other was 160. And then my history of psych class had 42 students in it. So for that, I was juggling a lot of students and what I chose to do was get up very early that morning, check my email at least every 10 or 15 minutes, honestly, throughout until the 5 p.m. time period came and my students had finished because there were students who would have a problem. So they would tell me, okay, I was taking the exam and all of a sudden the exam, my whole computer crashed, I don't know what to do. And they would typically show up on Zoom or email me panicked. And I can go back and UB Learns, I learned all of this, and check what was their progress on the exam. Were they answering each question as they went along? And I could see if their pattern of responding matched their reason for not completing the exam and then decide if I needed to start them over. So I did that. What else did I do? I enabled Discussion Board, which I had never used before, but it's a tool on UB Learns. And Discussion Board enables you to pose a question and students to respond. So what I would often do is pose a question in lecture, or there was, in my History of Psych class, I had students watch a, a video of an in-person 
psychoanalytic psychotherapy session. And then I ask them to go to discussion board and show me what they could in terms of applying the concepts we learned in the course about psychoanalytic psychotherapy and how they saw that implemented by the therapist and what the results were. And I was really pleasantly surprised to see the level of thought that students were doing. So this mimicked what I would have been doing in class, but it just happened on discussion boards. And then I regularly checked and responded to student input. So one thing I think is important, if you enable something like this, to check it and respond to students. So I did that daily. In my larger class where I had hundreds of students, I had my teaching assistants also do that to make sure that students got a response within 24 hours. And then I had office hours. I normally have two office hours a week. I increased that to three office hours a week. And these were held via Zoom. And I used the waiting room feature to control attendance. So you can do that. And the reason I chose that was oftentimes students are coming to office hours to talk about things they wouldn't want to talk about in front of other students. Maybe it's their test performance or their hardship this semester. Using the waiting room let me decide who comes in and is talking in a particular session. And I could also kind of message the waiting room and say, does anybody in here want to talk about this topic? If you do, I'll put you in. And so we kind of organized the discussion around that. So what assistance did I receive? As I mentioned, we have experienced faculty in our department who teach online. So I talked to all of them. Um, or at least most of them, and asked them what their approach to online teaching was and what advice they had. And they were extremely helpful sounding boards for what to do. I also collaborated with other faculty who were also as inexperienced as me on learning the technology needed. So what we did was divide it up. Like, you learn WebEx, I'll learn Zoom, um, I'll work on this aspect of Panopto, you work on that aspect of Panopto, I'll figure out how to do UB Learns assignments, you figure out how to do UB Learns exams, and then we taught each other. So it was a collaborative endeavor to figure this out together. And I think that worked really well. And then I did call UB Learns support and they could not have been more patient and kind and helpful and very direct uh, with their help. I had trouble with collaborative grading on UB Learn. So I was doing this with some of my teaching assistants and we could not figure out how to reconcile the grades appropriately. So we called UB Learn support and they basically said, yeah, you don't want to use that tool. You want to use this tool. And it was an easy fix and they were extremely helpful. So what were my results from my perspective, from my faculty perspective? Well, the learning curve, as Graham was talking about, the, the learning curve was steep given the short time turnaround. And I'm somebody who uses technology in the classroom, but had not used these tools for online or distance learning. So this learning curve was steep. And I often um, kind of resorted to um, coping laughter, where I felt like I was an idiot and I was the absolute stereotype of the technologically challenged professor who doesn't know anything and can't learn this. Um, so I would just kind of laugh at myself and that was helpful. But it was a steep learning curve. The preparation of course materials was a significant time investment. And this was something I did not anticipate to the degree that it, it ended up impacting me. So typically if I give a 50 minute lecture, it takes me 10 minutes to walk to class, 50 minutes to give the lecture, 10 minutes to walk back to class, no problem. But when you're recording lectures, you have to edit them uh, so you record and edit out the little beginning part where you're getting things set up. You record the, the lecture content itself. If you do something during lecture that you think, well, that wasn't ideal, you could redo that. But every time you're editing the lecture, it's getting downloaded and re-uploaded to a server, and that takes time. So, and then there's the, the feature of you can go back and listen to yourself and edit yourself and that's a challenge uh, because you can think well maybe i could say that better so that was a time investment setting up assignments on ub learns is an, an investment of time to set that up it's not like printing out your assignment and handing it out in class but the biggest time investment i would say were exams that i didn't anticipate so normally this goes beyond just a paper and pencil exam where you've prepared the questions once you have the questions ready you need to program UB Learns to give that exam. 
and they have many, many options for you, which is good, but at the same time, kind of ferreting through all of those choices, it can be overwhelming. So for me, I give exams that often are a scenario with multiple questions after that. And it's not just you know, a set of 50 separate questions, it's linked questions. In order to program those types of exams, it's completely doable in UBLearns, but those are set up differently than just isolated questions. So that took me a lot of time. And when I say a lot, how much do I mean? The first time I set up an exam in UB Learns, I think I had a, between 40 and 45 questions on the exam, and it took me six hours to program UB Learns to get it correct. That was part of the learning curve. Toward the end of the semester, I got down to about between three and four hours for that kind of exam, so it was more doable. What else? My results. I really went in with the mindset of trying to make the best of a difficult situation. So the situation was difficult for everybody. There were times I felt like, and I had in my head, I was just trying to land a burning plane that, okay, class is not on its normal course and I'm going to need to figure out how to land this plane. And so that was my mindset. And if option A were teaching this in person, I decided, okay, I'm gonna focus on maximizing option B. As much as I lamented losing option A, I'm gonna focus on maximizing option B. And that helped me to think, okay, this is what we're doing. It also was helpful for me to kind of go through the idea that it was never gonna be perfect. So when you record yourself in a lecture and you hear yourself, it's, you could tweak a million things to make it just a little bit better or smoother or whatever else. But I tried to tell myself at some point, you just gotta let it go, there is no perfect. And that was a result that Kind of came from trial and error and doing it. My course averages and my course evaluations were similar to past semesters. So one concern I had was making the exams open book, was that going to inflate my grades? And it really didn't. So I was very surprised at this, but it was echoing what I'd heard from other faculty as well. My course averages were between one and two percentage points of what they typically are when I teach these classes. So I thought that was a successful uh, result for this, that that choice didn't end up inflating my grades. What about from the student's perspective? So looking at student comments, what I heard, first and foremost, some students wanted the class to be in person rather than online. So they'd had half of a semester in person and they lamented that we'd gone online. And I understood that and you know, I agreed with them. Yes, it was more um, what we're used to in person than online. And then some wanted, this was interesting, some wanted more time for tests because they were open book and they said, you know, if you gave us a full set of number of hours, I could look up all the answers. So what that told me, and I learned this early on after the first exam I gave, was that I needed better communication to the students about why we had a set amount of time that this was just like an exam in an in-person class where you don't have additional time to look up the answers. The book is just there. Um, as a backup, if you need it for one item or two, that you need to study just like you do for a regular exam. And with that better communication, I got less uh, questions about that. Other students really appreciated the similarity of the online lectures to in-person ones. So they said, okay, things seemed pretty similar. They liked the predictability of it. So the fact that they were posted at a set time. They also liked the interactive elements that I did. And I was happy to see that because that was the the element of teaching that I wanted to preserve the most. What was my su most surprising outcome? I think there were a couple. First, in recording lectures like this, I didn't anticipate this and didn't think about it before, but it makes sense to me now. If the benefits of this online format for students who are not native English speakers. So I heard from a number of international students who said, this has actually been very helpful for me. I was able to rewatch the lectures and get things that I didn't get on the first go round. So I found this very helpful. And to those students who juggled their busy work or childcare schedules, I had students who told me I won't be in class a lot because I have to work. Or, and I had one student who routinely brought her child to class and her child was absolutely very well behaved and it didn't bother me at all but she was juggling a lot and they both told me those two students as well as some others 
because I had this busy work schedule, now um, I'm able to watch the lectures at a time that really works for me. So I think that was a benefit that I didn't anticipate. A benefit for me was realizing what a privilege it is to teach in-person classes. So I typically teach three classes a day, three days a week. And at the end of the day, I can feel, especially at the end of the week, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm exhausted. And I think it will be a long time before I ever say that again, once we go back to in-person classes because of how much I, I think it is a privilege to be able to teach in that way. I made the best of the situation, but I will always be a person who values in-person teaching. What can I share with others for their transition to remote teaching? Well, first, challenges and mishaps are to be expected. So very similar to what Maria conveyed, it's just part of this. Uh, you're never gonna get everything perfect. Things are gonna go wrong. The key is just to, to be there and, and open and willing and flexible to figure out how to make it better. And to seek out support, technical support and collegial support, I think is incredibly important. I often felt in this environment as though, especially when I was doing exams and UB Learns, that I was in an escape room and I'd run out of options and there was no other ideas I had. But there's a reason most people don't do escape rooms alone. They do that with other people because there are other voices who have new ideas and look at things in new ways. It happened to me once where I thought I'd clicked everything on this page. And one of my colleagues said, there's a tiny little gray arrow right there. You click on that. It was like, oh, okay. So seek out support. And this is what really helped me. I found it important to find a way to be myself in this teaching environment. So when I talked to really experienced online teachers, they rattled off all the things that they do. And immediately I felt like I needed to be doing all of those things. I need to do all of these things that all of these other experienced people are doing. And then I kind of regrouped and said, wait a minute, what do I value in my teaching? How do I implement that in this new environment? It really made me look back the way I did when I first became a teacher. After looking at other teachers and trying to ape what they did, I don't feel like I was ever really effective as a teacher until I figured out who I was. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, kind of as a touchstone in this new environment. Remember who you are as a teacher and find a way to make this environment service that. Uh, so that's, that's my advice. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen now so you can see me, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, we have a number of questions, so we'll see how many we can get. Okay. Through. So, um, first question was for the quiz responses. Were they via chat, audio, or an online platform? And why did you choose that format? So for my quizzes, it was more test yourself. Um, Panopto has Panopto quizzes built in, so you can have a quiz that you create in Panopto that then transfers to your UB Learns gradebook. That's a possibility. I didn't end up using that just because it, it took away from the lecture flow that I had. So mine was really just putting up a PowerPoint slide of here's this quiz, test yourself, pause it, now come back, and let's talk about all of these answers. So I did it that way. Okay. So a number of questions about exams. So mm -hmm. I believe you said they weren't proctored. So uh, the questions are, did you see any issues of academic dishonesty during the tests? And then there was a second question about whether you used any honesty, honesty statement on a syllabus or on top of the test. Um, so maybe but, you could address both of those. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'll take the latter question first. That's what I absolutely did. So on the syllabus, I had a statement about academic integrity. And then in the exam procedures, what I did was I had a statement basically stating why academic integrity is important. And students had to sign before they took every test that they promised to adhere to the principles of academic honesty and that they would not be getting any outside help from this. It was open book and open note, but not um, shared with other classmates and not on the internet. You're not going to do that. You're going to do open notes, open book, and that's it. And so students signed before every exam for that. 
I did not, I mean, some of it is how would I know, right? If students collaborated together on this exam, would I know? I probably wouldn't. But I would have expected if that were really common that I would have seen a pretty good increase in the averages in my classes, the overall averages on an exam and the overall average in the class. And I did not see that. So that could have been happening. In this environment, it's really about how much you can control. They do have the lockdown browser and things like that. And I do have colleagues that have used that, but they're not foolproof. So the way I looked at it was, I'm not gonna be able to control everything. I'm gonna control as much as I could. I did not hear from any other students that they witnessed people cheating or that there were group chats or things like that. Sometimes students will relay that if they hear that that's going on. I did not hear any of it. Could it have been happening? Sure. So there was a question about the time frame that you gave the students to complete exams. So I think it was like a total of seven hours. Um, and they were wondering, there, you know, some students probably had all seven hours available to complete it. Other students, because of their schedule, may have only had one. Did you get any feedback or complaint from students about uh, not having the full seven hours or the time frame of the exam? I, I got a comment really just from one student and after the semester ended that said, I wish I would have had more time for this. Our class time was included in that time bracket. So if I were to say, okay, you were available in the semester for this time period, you know, you should be able to be available now, although that changed for many students. Um, I didn't get a lot of people saying I had no time to do this. And if I did, it may have had like one or two students who said on this day, I have something else. And so I just open their window later. And you can do that in UB Learns. So it was very customizable, but I didn't get a lot of pushback. They liked the flexibility. Um, so a couple of the questions have to do with UB Learns. Since you seem to uh, have learned so much about it, I think you're a, a UB <laughs> Learns uh, support person now. Um, oh my but, goodness. But they are wondering, you know, you talked about, um, not having the students be able to backtrack on the exam. I think you said you had it all open. Um, and this question has to do with um, backtracking. And if in UB Learns, can you limit the backtracking to a specific number of questions? Like you can backtrack only to the last three questions. Um, it seems like that would meet the need of faculty and limiting cheating and students by providing some flexibility to review answers. I, I don't know if you know the answer to that, or I don't know if we have any UB Learn support people on who might be able to chime in. I would probably defer to them. What I saw at the time when I was investigating it was one question at a time, and that was all that they could do. And so I didn't, I didn't do that so they could see all of the questions. Would it be nice if they could, you know, have a bracket of, of questions? Yes, but I would defer to any UB Learns expert who might know that. Do you see using these recorded lectures and the UB Learns exams in the future, even when we go back to fully in person? That's a good question. I really am in favor of in person teaching. So I would say if I needed to for some other reason, <clears throat> like I can't be in class or something like that, I would do a recorded lecture. But usually, I think if I could be there, I would. So that's always going to be my preference. But that said, with exams, I've always given in paper exams. I know that there have been issues with giving exams in a large classroom. <clears throat> I'm willing to, to consider things like that, but the control that I have when it's a paper and pencil exam, I feel better about. That's, that's what I, I look at as, okay, that's when I, I know what's up. And I think I need to know more about the technological capabilities if I were to do say a, that in class like I know UB wants to move toward giving electronic exams I just want to know more about the parity for all students and is it fair because it, I don't think it's the same thing if a student doesn't have good technology and they have to take it on a phone versus a student that can take it on a very large computer um, I want to create a even playing field for everybody so those are there'd be a number of things I'd want to investigate before I decided yes I'm all on board with that but I'll always be someone who values face-to-face, one-on-one, talking with students. Usually in my classes, I have periods where we do something, I'm walking around, I'm talking to small groups of students, 
And I don't know that I'm ever going to get exactly that in an online environment. I'm going to do my best to do that as best I can, but I'll always value that. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I mean, you had so much to learn as a faculty member to make this transition, but to acknowledge that the students also had to uh, meet some challenges doing that transition. So um, could you elaborate just a little bit, like how much time did you devote to those practice procedures and how did the students respond to those? Like the practice exam procedures? That yeah. was easy. So in UB Learns, that was pretty straightforward for questions and I made it active. I made it an extra credit so students were incentivized to do it. If students didn't do it, I would know. And so I would reach out to them and say, you didn't do the practice. I want to make sure you're still here with me. Um, you know, is there a reason you didn't do it? Just that to make sure that they were okay. I think students really liked it because then they felt like on exam day, it wasn't the first time that they had done this. So I think that worked well. And, but learning everything, I really did spend the entire spring break in crash boot camp for all the technology that I needed to learn. And what was nice is basically others were too. So it felt like we were in this camp to figure out all of these things. And then I felt empowered because previously I'd felt like, oh, online teaching, there's so much to learn. I don't know that I ever wanna do that. I really like in-person teaching. But now I felt a little bit like a badass. Like, okay, now I know how to do this. Um, now I know how to post a lecture. Now I know how to do this. And so if I choose to, to remain an in-person teacher for as long as I possibly can, I know I'm choosing because it's the choice I like, not because I'm afraid of the alternative. Was there, was there anything that you uh, wanted to do that you weren't able to achieve with the online testing? Um, well, if I had, if it was possible to do, you know, perfect proctoring and you would know that nobody was, was cheating, that would be ideal. Um, with the online testing, I think the UB Learns itself has many options. So it, that worked very well. I have one, I would say this, I did change some of my exam questions. So especially in my history of psych class, which would have elements of recall this history with an open book format, that wasn't gonna work. So I changed them to those application questions. And I have one section of my final in history of psychology that's a matching section of people and major ideas. And I did not include that in the online environment. I included other questions instead because I didn't know if UB Learns could do, I know it can do matching, but it couldn't do exactly the matching with the physical structure that I have when I have a paper and pencil test. But otherwise it was very flexible. Great, so let's wrap up with one last question. I saved this one for last. And okay. it says you went from being someone who never wanted to teach online to someone who's really being featured today for your best practices. So what does that say about UB's collective potential for excellence in teaching this coming semester, even though we're still gonna be pretty much online for a lot of it? Well, I think that's a good question. I, I don't know that I was chosen because I'm the best online teacher, but because I'm somebody who um, does teach a lot and has gone through this process. And my when I was asked to do this, I was asked as lessons learned. I was, I agreed because it was lessons learned um, and not you're the most experienced online teacher because I am not. There are people in my department that are more experienced. But what I thought I could convey today was what this was like to go from a real person that was resistant to this to now doing it fully and my learning curve um, in this. And that's what I thought I could share. And I guess what I would say is if I can do this, uh, you can do this. And I just want to reiterate again, and I would say as my parting message, find a way to do this that is meaningful for you. And that makes this something that you feel is an extension of you. That's what helped me with my motivation in this and feeling like, okay, that's going to keep me going. I'm going to figure out a way to be me here. And I would encourage everybody to do that. I think we all have the potential to do that. So the potential is, is definitely there. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, and thank everybody for, for doing this work. Yeah, and certainly on behalf of everybody participating today, thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us. Thank you.